This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Today on Know How, your questions are answered. Welcome to Know How. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Palliser. I am Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to be taking your questions, mixing up some answers, and then pouring it back into the knowledge jar. That's right. That you've got. Right into that knowledge jar. On the head. Better seal it tight. Yeah, because that spoils. <laughs> All right, so Brian, um, we've, got a, we've got a fun kind of episode today because I wanted to show Is off some... every toys. episode we do fun? But this one's special, super, super mega, mega, fun. Kamea, mea fun. I hope our TD feels that way. I know, right? No, <laughs> she's too early. She's just staring at us like, just get just, this over just, with. Just, <laughs> just, just finish it. Yeah. Well, we've got some unboxings that we got to do. Yes. Uh, we got to show off uh, a cool new monitor. I've got something maybe in the storage arena that most people are going to be jelly. Mm. But, uh, you know, we got to start off with something that I think... Is a, is a good callback to something that we've already covered in our Arduino 102 series. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a question here from Jim Hoffmans, who specifically wanted to know how he could use our know-how knowledge to help with a uh, automation project he's been working on. Okay, so Jim asks, my sprinkler control took a hit a couple of years ago. I wired in override switches for manual control, but it's time to put back the automation. I decided a local control panel would be the fastest way to get it working. Wireless could be added after the fact, so my plan is to use an Arduino, but the R Raspberry Pi would be easier to implement the wireless stuff. I need to figure out how to store values permanently on the Raspberry Pi. It shouldn't be an issue on the Arduino, but I haven't seen it done. Uh, Jim, this is fantastic because it's, it's, got, it's got a couple of topics for us. The first is this whole, the eternal Raspberry Pi or Arduino. Mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi or Arduino. And I get it, I understand, the Raspberry Pi is more expensive, but it's got all the stuff you want. It's got right. Ethernet. It's got if you've got the three, it's got or the new three. It's got wireless. Yeah, and Bluetooth. And Bluetooth, and you can run a complete operating system that you can shell into from remote and make sure everything is cool. Fancy. All of that stuff you can kind of do with an Arduino, mm -hmm. but it's it's add-ons. You have to add on an Ethernet or a Wi-Fi shield. It's not really going to be able to run like a full web server, so it's going to be a very rudimentary interface. Right. And so people tend to, to gravitate towards the Raspberry Pi. It's familiar. It's familiar. And in fact, Aaron Newcomb made a sprinkler control, automation control, mm -hmm. from a Raspberry Pi Zero and a bank of relays, just like the relays that we've played with here I on Know How. That. My thing is this, though. You know, and I know, that if you shut down a Raspberry Pi incorrectly, <laughs> bad things can happen. Yeah, and it you know it doesn't have to be a Raspberry Pi either. It could be it's a computer. It's a little computer. A computer exactly. And what happens is if you disconnect mm. the power in and not a like shutdown sort of fashion, it can not unmount but destroy the SD card yeah. that you have. And yeah. and, and by destroy from, you mean corrupting the image. Corrupt. Like you could corrupt the flat. Image. It's not going to destroy the not, memory itself. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the SD card's not going to it, explode. It, 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 <laughs> but all the the work that you did like loading on an OS right. or updating the the software is going to be undone, and you'll have to redo yeah. that. Yeah. And now I I know most people would say, well, no, I take care of my stuff. You know, I, the Raspberry Pi would be on a UPS or a, a power conditioner. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, I, I get that. But when I'm thinking of an industrial application, and automation is, honestly, it's an industrial <laughs> application. Yes. I like to think of something that will survive worst case scenario. It's going to overheat. It's going to shut down. It's going to have some funky shorts that, you know, would kill a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. But to an Arduino, that's, it's, that's embedded life. That's what it does. It, you, you power cycle it, and it comes right back up. Yeah. And I guess the, the main difference is that Arduino's technically a microcontroller, right? And right. the Raspberry Pi is just a computer. It's a general purpose controller, yeah. right? So uh, an Arduino is a computer. It's running an operating system. I'm uh, oh, sorry, Raspberry Pi. An Arduino, it's like, because oh, no. it's... I've had it wrong no, all no. these years. <laughs> no, just Because it's just a microcontroller, all it's doing is writing the instructions that you gave to it over and over and over again. Yeah. Much simpler, um, and I tend to like simpler. Yes, but that hasn't stopped you from destroying a couple of Arduinos no, either. No, I've, so. I've smoked them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny, I think it's also because I buy super cheap ones. 
Uh, yeah. That I really shouldn't. You should support your maker community and buy genuine Arduinos. But you buy them in bulk because you have a lot of different projects yeah. that you're trying out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when I when I move to final project, I typically, that's when I get the authentic. But mm -hmm. if, if it's just prototype and I know I'm going to destroy them, I'm not going to pay 10x. And by destroy them too, you mean like you've overvolted them, right? Which pops like a little view, or, fuse yeah, on it? Yeah, or, you know, done something like, oh, I don't need to disconnect power. I can solder this while it's on. You know, it's, it's just, <laughs> don't do that. Okay, okay. Oh, but specifically, he, he is concerned mm -hmm. because he can't store values. This is a very common concern when people are doing projects with, with Arduinos. Mm -hmm. On a Raspberry Pi, you've got a file system, so you can always save to the file system. Right. On an Arduino, when you shut off, when you power cycle, it clears the memory, mm -hmm. right? Because remember, there's three types of memory in the Arduino. There's the flash. There's where all the instructions are kept. Your programming will stay because it's a non-volatile memory. But then there's the system memory. And the system memory is where you would store things like variables. Right. Like, for example, the variables that you want to keep. And if you power cycle, that, that goes away. So there is a way to save those values, though, right? There is. There is a third type of memory in an Arduino called EEPROM. Now, we talked about this on Arduino 102. Right. When we, uh, I, I brought back the old days. And in the old days, you know, we had the, the PROMs and the EEPROMs. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was you could erase them using ultraviolet light. Uh, but now there is an electronically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. That's what's on an Arduino, mm -hmm. which allows you, if you know the code sequence, to store values inside of non-volatile memory that will be maintained even when you shut off power. Right. And, but you have a limited amount that you can use. You correct? do. So 1024, so 1,024 cells of 8 bits each, one byte each. Right. Yeah. But uh, instead okay. of us re-explaining how this works, I thought we would just take a gander back to that episode of Arduino 102 and show Jim exactly how it's done. That's all it does. So as I press, and see how it's looping over? Yeah. So if I hold it, it just keeps rising, keeps rising, keeps rising. Let cool. it go. But here's the problem. If I pull power, so if I reapply power, I have to do a quick boot, you'll notice when I start the counter again, it's going to start from zero. Ah, okay. that's cool. The, which, well, I mean, yes, but the problem is that I'm losing my values. Oh, yeah, what if, but it still works. What if that counter was important? Like, for example, let, let's go to my Groduino example. What if that was counting uh, how long it does the watering? And then it, it Lost loses power. power in the middle of its watering cycle, oh, and it thinks no. it's starting all over. Right, and then you come back to a flooded bedroom. I come back to a flooded bedroom. <laughs> or, you know, even worse, what if uh, I'm using this to count on how much nutrients to add to the water, and it keeps having a bug where, like, it keeps browning out, mm -hmm. and it just keeps resetting to zero before it gets to the stop. You speak like a man who's gone through that yeah, before. Yeah, this, this, this is not hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> this, this actually did happen. What we need is we need a way to make sure that that value, whatever that counter is, is persistent. It stays after power off. Okay. okay. And that's what we got to use the EEPROM for, And that's right? what we're going to use the EEPROM. So if you go back to my screen, Carol, we have a wonderful little example here for the EEPROM. It's the same program. I've now added the other three buttons because I need them to do things. If I hit button three, first of all, You'll notice I have a while statement here. This is actually kind of important. Notice how when I hit those, uh, the, the first button, it's, it actually counts up really, really fast, right? Right. If I have the write function, so writing to my EEPROM function, set up the same way that I set up the counter, oh. it's going to write hundreds, thousands of times if I just hold that button down. And that probably it can't do that, right? It wears it, it out. Slow? I get yeah. 100,000 writes per cell. So it Ooh. sounds like a lot, but if, if, you, if you mess up, yeah. and have it in the, the regular loop. I mean, an Arduino can go through thousands of loops in a minute, and you could just kill all of the, the life of the cell. So I want to make sure that when I push that button, it only writes once. Okay. This is my function. EEPROM put. Dot put. Okay. Yeah, and you can, you, you can look up the, in Arduino, the, uh, their database, you can look up all the EEPROM functions. Put's really simple. Put the value of counter, so, and this, this, I could hard code this, I could actually have it be a number, but I'm saying put whatever the value is of counter, that's the, uh, the variable I'm using to count up and down. Right. And then put it into cell number 100. That's and it. And why 100? I just chose 100. I could okay. choose, choose anything from zero to 100, uh, 1,023. Okay. Because I've got 1K of memory. So it's one byte memory cells. Okay. So eight bits to 256 possible values. 
Okay. Okay, so just, just know that. It's 256. <laughs> if I want to store a value that's higher than 256, I have to do some creative math to cut it up into multiple cells. So I can increase and decrease. So let's, let's say I want the value of 16. Okay. So if I press this third button, Save. saved. Okay. Did you write in the function to, to show save? Yes, I did. Okay, yeah, I that's, all, that's <laughs> I all in there. That. <laughs> but now, look, so if I increase or decrease, but then I go back and I hit the fourth button, which restores. Mm -hmm. Restored. It's going to go back to 16. Okay. And so if I pull well, power. Hold on. What if I change it to 22? Now pull power. OK, yeah. okay. Oh, I got it. So you want it to be a different a value. A different number, because okay. it's supposed to come back to 16. Right. So right? I'm going to pull the, uh, pull the power. I'm going to reconnect it. It's going to do its little boot up dance, because it's a boot up dance. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. OK, there we go. There so now I have to hit restore. And boom. 16. Back to 16. All right. So nice. this, this is where I want to store any persistent information. So for example, in our Groduino, mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing input where I set a, a, a grow time. Mm -hmm. well, or, a, or like a, a watering, a watering time. time. yeah, Or a lighting time, or whatever it might be. fertilizing time. Fertilizing time. I don't want to have to re-input that every single time the thing loses power. Right. It, it'd be like your VCR flashing 12 all the time. <laughs> I mean, it works fine as long as you don't lose power. Right. Well, you could buy a UPS and keep the thing battery powered at all times, or you could write it into your program so that every once in a while, when it needs to, it saves it to memory, and then when it boots, it recalls it from memory. Now, when we're doing this, the thing you have to remember about using that kind of memory yeah. is, again, as I mentioned, you've got a certain number of rewrites. Right. Uh, so don't use them up. Yeah, because uh, it's just like uh, an SSD, right? It's just like, like you've got 100,000 or something like that writes, which, again, right. sounds like a lot. But, but if, if it's constantly that thing, happening. Yeah, if you code it improperly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go away. The other thing to, to remember is I hard-coded values for mm -hmm. where to store inside the memory array. But there is a function in there that basically, it's like trim for your SSD. It allows you to, to randomize. So you're not hitting the same memory cell over and over and over again. You just need some way to, to know where it's pointing, what the actual index is. Right, right. And so for this project that we were talking about, the sprinkler thing, is, are there Arduinos that have more memory for EEPROM? Or like, yes. isn't there like a yeah, higher tier? Or right, something? like so the one I'm using right now for, our, for the Growduino project, which unfortunately we're probably not going to get to until after I get back from uh, my tertianship, mm -hmm. but that's got four times the memory. Right. Uh, and, you know, more expansive programs that can do more, that have, you know, much more memory for, for the, the actual code that you write. Mm -hmm. uh, but in most of the projects that we've done, you can get away with the smallest at mega chipset. It's, okay. you know, yeah, so there's not a lot of constraints. Depending on the project that you're doing, and the, what was the question? It was sprinklers, right? Yeah. He was doing like a sprinkler system. Yeah. There's probably not a ton of variables that yeah. you'd be dealing with. So uh, we, we are going to show uh, the creation of the Groduino, and the Groduino and your, your automation program are basically the same thing. It's a, a little LCD screen, the 2004 that we played with, this an I squared C device, mm -hmm. along with the menu system and four buttons. And with a menu system of four buttons and that LCD screen, you can basically make it do anything. Because remember, an Arduino can trigger that little 5-volt relay. Right. And that 5-volt relay can handle everything from 30 amps of DC all the way up to AC power. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's everything. That's, that's the ability to control everything. Nice, nice, yeah. A pretty cool little project. Uh, one other thing I, I'd, I'd like to add to this project is if he really likes the Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. there is a way to use the Arduino controllers as sort of the endpoints and the Raspi as the brain. Uh, I see. So this is a project that I've been working on. I Unfortunately, I, I kind of stalled because I got bored and I moved <laughs> on. That's what I do. I, yeah. But uh, the Arduino is the web server. Mm -hmm. And then it actually, oh, sorry, the, the, the Raspberry web, Pi is the web, web server. server. And then it connects to the indiv individual Arduinos whose job it is to control their particular part of the automation. Okay. So all it does is essentially say, turn on one, turn off two, turn on three, turn off four, et cetera, et cetera. And just goes down the line. Hmm. The, the advantage of that is you get kind of the reliability of an Arduino right. where it will survive anything. It will keep doing its job no matter what. But you get the communications ability of the Raspberry Pi. Right, and then I guess you could also use the, the graphical interface on the Raspberry yep. Pi, which Absolutely. is easier for me to understand when like dealing with files or connecting to other devices and things like that. Whereas like with yeah, the Arduino, you're just you're putting up the code to it, and then yep. I think it's got what it needs. <laughs> now, actually, by the way, uh, 
just let's go off the rails a little bit. Uh, we've been working on the little uh, retro pie. Yes. Uh, the Twitendo to, re- to replace Twitendo. the NES Classic that went away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one, you know how you, uh, in the original one, you, you bought a little device for the shutdown, save shutdown, right? Yeah, it was called like the Mosberry circuit, which you would hit the button, it would trip the relay, and then that it was would send commands send to, the command the to the Raspberry Pi to tell it to shut down. I figured out how to do it with an Arduino. So with a $3 Nano, I can do the same thing. Nice. Plus, that Nano will also control things like little light animations on the case. Ah, we got to pimp it out. Come on, fancy. it's the Twitendo. It's got to be awesome. The Twitendo, yeah, the, the inspiration was because the Nintendo Classic was uh, such a big hit, yep. but it was also so limited. You know, it has the, the controllers that are really small and, and then tethered to the device. 30, 30 games, games, 50 games, something like that. Yep, which please. people were able to then hack and right. put more games on too, but... Come on, you don't want just NES games. You want SNES, what, Sega, maybe even N64. Actually, off the rails even more, a uh, project I want to do, water-cooled Raspberry Pi, overclocked to 1.2 uh, gigahertz, can play N64 games, like, <laughs> perfectly. So I'm looking into doing maybe right. a mineral, you remember our mineral yeah, yeah, oil let's uh, do it. cooling project? Yeah, with a Raspberry Pi. I'm down. I still have the mineral oil. I still have the little pumps and seals that we need to make this thing work. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, just so you know, yeah, mineral oil gets really, <laughs> really messy. I know. Really That's why I'm a little messy. hesitant to do it. But, And I have to be 100% sure that I get all the cables and everything that I need connected. And then not once I pour yeah, the mineral oil. Yeah, trying to service like, it after hmm. it's already gotten oily, it's, I, from experience... It's tough. And not only that, remember, the thing about mineral oil versus something like uh, 3M's Novak or Florinert yeah. is that it tends to climb up wicks uh, like wires. So yeah. if you have wires going down, mm-hmm. what you'll find is like <laughs> oil will just start showing up outside. Well, it's because it's, it's climbed up the casing of the wire through the power supply and starts coming out. Uh, it's so messy, it's but messy. it looks so just, cool it if, you can, if you can do it properly. Yeah, especially mm-hmm. if you put lights in it. Yes, LEDs, and then you get the little the fan pushing them. Why do so many of our projects just devolve into lights? I was just gonna say LEDs on everything. everything. <laughs> you know, it makes be cool? us happy. Let's put LEDs on it. Hey, hey, I mean, you know, I like them too. I'm... Well, she's the proud owner of the clock yeah. that you made. Oh, you mean that we're going I mean, to that make you're going to make in two months. <clears throat> <laughs> you, she, she's seen the it's prototype. Not, yeah, I saw, I saw, yeah, his designs, the blueprints. Time travel, Brian. Yes. Time travel, be aware. Yes, time travel. All right, let's go ahead and move on to something that's not flashy lights. We actually have a very good question from a, 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 twi- a Kita about Kita. Intel's brand new storage memory. Brian, what we got? All right, so they ask, I have a home-built PC based on an Asus X99 motherboard with an Intel i7. Recently, I've been looking at storage upgrades, and there are plenty of potential SSDs, but now I am not sure because the Intel Optane modules look incredible. Has the Intel X-Point technology just made flash SSDs obsolete? Are there even any flash SSDs that can compete with X-Point? Should I save my money for a large X-Point module? All right. Now we're talking, of course, about uh, the the crosspoint technology that Intel developed. Right. It's 3D memory architecture that does not use transistors, so it's much faster addressing. That's pretty cool. The whole idea behind it is that uh, it's 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 difficult to call it just a storage technology. Mm-hmm. It's got so much potential to kind of blur the distinction between storage and memory. You could essentially have an SSD that's fast enough to run as memory. So essentially, yeah, what is the, the, the breakdown of the difference between an SSD and RAM? Then? Right. So I've got my processor. I've got my memory. The memory is what is sort of like the brain space of the processor. Anytime mm-hmm. the processor is executing code, it's executing it inside the memory. The memory is, is fantastically fast. Right. Then I go a, a system down and connect it through the PCI bus is the storage. The storage is typically an order of magnitude or more slower than memory because it, it, you're not executing things out of the out of the storage. Mm-hmm. You're transporting things in and out of memory and then executing it in there. Right. So, th- so does that, that make makes sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Right. So you don't need the. F- I mean, th- it's good to have fast storage, but the storage does not need to be as fast as the system memory because the system memory, if it's slow, it will bottleneck the processor. Right. What Intel has done is to make something that could be as large as a typical SSD, but is the memory. So you could. You could execute in place. 
It, Does I mean, that it, eliminate the need for RAM at all? Well, kind of. It, it would. It would. I mean, uh, but here's the thing. We don't have systems that do that yet. All of our systems are still the traditional processor memory storage subsystem. Right. So until we start seeing next gen and probably next, 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 next gen systems, <laughs> we won't have that conflict. So what Intel has done in the meantime is they, they need to get the technology out there. They want people to see how, how much promise there is. So they've backed off from their claims of you know, a thousand fold increase of speed over a standard SSD mm -hmm. to their new cross point modules called the Optane. And, and Kara, if you go there, we've got this one. This is from uh, Amazon right now. So you can, well, you can't get it now because it's out of stock, but oh. they've got two modules that they released, the 16 gig, uh, gigabyte and the 32 gigabyte. So this, and they're both M.2, so they will fit into M.2 slots. Uh, and let's see, the 16 gigabyte costs about 60 bucks and the 32 gigabyte costs about $93, which is, not a lot of money, but also that's pretty small. Uh, yeah, it's a little steep <clears throat> for the price of memory. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, it's because it's, it's not memory. It's, it's this is. I mean, it is, but it isn't. They're they're <laughs> they're uh, they're building this as cash. So this is cash for a hard drive because it's actually pretty fast. It's oh, not man. as fast as Crosspoint can be, but you're talking about uh, what is it? Um, uh, something like 1,200 megabytes per second read, 280 megabytes per second write. Uh, which is not as fast as the fastest uh, M.2 SSD from, from Intel. Right. Uh, and also, but it could do 300,000 IOPS read and about 70,000 IOPS write. So what is the best uh, use for this then? Cash. It's just, just cash. Cash. So you'd have a, a large drive behind this. So a slower drive that gets cached by this module. <laughs> so an SSD for an SSD, like kind a hybrid of, yeah. SSD thing? Yeah. Or, or, or an SSD for a hard drive. Or right? a hard, like, yeah, you know, a traditional hybrid setup. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, she said that she's running an i7 mm -hmm. on a, an Asus X99 motherboard, which is great. I, I like that combo. Mm -hmm. But she didn't mention what generation the chip is. Hmm. Optane will only work with 7th gen Intel processors. So 7th gen Intel i3, i5, and i7. Okay. Uh, hmm. So un unless you've got a 7th gen, forget about it. It won't work at all. The second thing is it will only work with Windows 10. Windows 10 is set up to take advantage of that, to actually use it as a caching module. Because honestly, even if you buy the biggest, 32 gigabytes isn't enough space for anything. No, no, no. I've got flash drives that are much bigger than 32 gigabytes. Right, and right? don't cost no. what, like that much for that amount of memory. Right. Now, then the question becomes, has Optane killed flash SSDs? And the answer is absolutely not. In fact, I had a chance to speak with someone who is in the know about it, and uh, he brought us a potential replacement for your old slow SSD. We all love speed, who doesn't? I mean, it's nice to load quicker, to save quicker, and to make sure that all of our data stays safe, which is why I've brought back an old friend of the show, Mr. Cameron Crandall, he's from Kingston. He's our, uh, our expert for all things fast and all things storage. Now, Cameron, You've brought us a little gift. What am I holding? So you are holding our new uh, DCP-1000 NVMe uh, high performance server class SSD. NVMe is really what's enabling uh, the next jump in performance uh, for solid state drives. And NVMe brings uh, standardization to how we attach SSDs to the PCI Express bus, which brings the cost down. And we've got a few different form factors, uh, half height, half length cards, uh, like you've got there, as well as 2.5 inch. All right, now let's talk a little bit about some of the technology that enables this, because I, 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 I preview the DCP-1000 at CES. We've briefly talked about it on Twiat. We had a segment with you last year in which, uh, when you were still designing this thing, we talked about some of the technology that goes into it. This is not what people expect out of a PCIe attached M.2 card. I mean, that's, that's typically what we've seen in this form factor. And right. it's nice, but Kingston's added something. You've done a little something special to this, to, to give me both the density and the performance that I might desire out of, say, a, a server part. Tell me a little bit about how you've, you've put this together. So the design approach is a little bit different than what you see in the, in the marketplace. Uh, if you look at the, the competitors in this space, most of them, you know, they'll lay down a, a, a high um, channel count controller, right. uh, you know, 16 or 32 channels, and then they lay flash down on, onto the card, um, and then they connect that to a, to a PCIe connection. What we do is we aggregate uh, four independent controllers uh, behind a switch on this card, 
which enables us to get the aggregate performance of four physical controllers and bring that to a, a by eight connection on the motherboard. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop you right there because uh, there's there's already people in our audience, I can hear them screaming from here, there's a disturbance in the force, they're saying, that's BS. You can't do that. We know this from the last time you were on where we, we realized we're running out of lanes. Uh, PCIe is fast, but once you start adding graphics cards and several PCIe connected devices, you just don't have the, the bandwidth to move the data that you need. You've solved that by using a switch, but my internal logic says if I put a switch, I'm going to be losing performance, not gaining it. So what are you doing here? So a, a couple things. We need the PCI switch just for what you said. We're, we're running out of PCIe lanes. So for NVMe-based storage, w switching technology is, is a reality. Uh, we've brought it to the half-height, half-length card to aggregate drives, uh, physical drives behind the switch to a single PCIe connection. Uh, we don't lose anything with the switch because we're doing all the switching in, in hardware. We're not doing it in software. Um, so there really is a, 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 a minor penalty in terms of, of latency and throughput uh, by attaching through a switch. I would say the benefits uh, far outweigh the, the, the cons here. All right, let, we, we gotta do a little bit of a, a payoff here because people are starting to hear about this technology. I wanna talk about it more. But can we actually show them the kind of performance that we're sure. getting off this? We've got this lovely machine set up on the table here. I'm assuming that you're going to be showing us a little bit of a benchmark. Let's let's set the standard first. If I were to have a fast M.2 piece from, from anyone, let's, mm -hmm. let's say the state of the art, what would my typical throughput slash IOPS be? So depending on the vendor, you're looking at off of a single M.2. Right, single. Uh, you're looking at anywhere from 2,000 to 2,500 megabytes a second of, of throughput. Uh, and then in terms of, of IOPS performance, you're probably looking somewhere in the neighborhood of, um, oh, 150 to 200,000 Which is, IOPS. yeah, that's decent. That's yeah. decent. Okay. All right. Now, uh, can you show us what you're getting? Sure. So uh, uh, in the, the system we have configured here today, we have one of our DCP-1000s, which we've been talking about, which is a half-height, half-length card. And then we also have our upcoming uh, DCU-1000. That's the U.2? That's the U.2. Um, and it's built in the same fashion that I described with the half-height, half-length card where we aggregate four separate control controllers behind uh, a switch. So what we're showing here today is these two physical devices using iometer, which everyone is, is pretty much familiar with, uh, we are producing 1.8 million uh, read IOPS um, uh, with iometer here off of two physical devices. So this drive is actually capable of delivering uh, 7,000 megabytes a second of <laughs> throughput. So uh, to get this kind of performance with a, a SATA-based solution, you know, we would need, you know, 24 drives um, behind three different RAID controllers oh my gosh. to be able to produce this type of, <laughs> of performance. So basically we're bringing flash array performance to a single PCI Express socket. Right now, we are sort of in the old world mindset of looking at storage performance where it's it's megabits or megabytes per second. That's that's what we're used to. That's what we see in the consumer area. We're evolving past that because it's no longer just how much data you can move, it's how many times you can hit it. It's how many different times you can access the storage array. Can you explain to us uh, in layman's term to the person out there who is maybe looking at building his own system, his own server, why IOPS matter? Why don't I just want as fast as possible? Why am I looking for a high IOPS? So, um, so we've got IOPS and bandwidth in, in, in this product, right? So for, from an IOPS uh, perspective, uh, these are IOs per second. Um, so in, in, in databases, IOPS are very, very important. So if you're running high performance databases, uh, we want to be able to deliver storage uh, that has a high transaction um, um, uh, profile. And that's what we're getting with with an NVMe type device. So uh, in, in the client space, we're not really too concerned with IOPS. We don't really we don't right. need them there. We more need the, the 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 sequential throughput. But for server applications and running databases and transaction processing, we need high IOPS and low latency. Is there any reason aside from bragging rights to have something like this in a in a consumer level box? You know, I, I think for the, the, the kind of the prosumer or the gamer, um, you know, I think there's definitely a, a market there for, for this type of a device. I, th I think it's really more suited for um, 
server and enterprise type applications. There's some other verticals that it would serve as well. Um, uh, Post-production video editing uh, mm -hmm. would be one uh, where you're dealing with um, high definition video content. Uh, you know, we're dealing with four and eight K video today and the, be, and the ability to be able to manipulate that in, uh, in, in without compression, right. you know, a card like this would, would, would fit well. But really where we see this being used is in, uh, you know, cloud service providers, uh, running databases, um, hyperscale type applications. Well, you say that, but I, I know right now every video editor out there is thinking this is my next upgrade. I mean, something like this, as you mentioned, is great for transactional servers, but if this speeds up my video rendering uh, uh, process, that's that's money well well, uh, well spent. Speaking of the money, I don't think we can leave the segment with talking without talking a little bit about the pricing. Uh, how big is this and how much would I be expected to pay for, say, the, the different size units? So um, right now, this is priced around uh, $1 per gigabyte or a, or a little bit less. Um, and if you look at SATA today, I mean, everybody compares this to SATA. Right. You know, it's not that much it, more expensive yeah. than, than SATA. SATA sits at about, you know, 45 cents to 50 cents per gigabyte. Um, and if you look at, at what these types of solutions cost before NVMe... Um, it's really quite a deal. Um, we were dealing with, you know, cards that were, you know, 500 gigabytes that cost $14,000. Um, and the fact that we now have NVMe, which brings standardization, uh, we've, the cost has been pushed way down and customers that were priced out of this, this type of a product in the, in the past is now affordable. Oh, this is fantastic. Now, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time here, but if you want to find out more, what you need to do is find the Twyet episode that we've put in the links because we did an in-depth in discussion with Cameron about all the technology and all the different things you need to know about this upcoming generation of SSD products. Cameron, thank you very much for speaking with us. If, if they wanted to find out more about you, more about Kingston, more about what you're doing with this technology, where should they go? Uh, they can check out our website at www.kingston.com and go to our SSD page. I'm Father Robert Balasser, and now that you've seen the future of SSDs, your move. Now, as we mentioned, there is absolutely positively no real practical reason why an end user would need one of these in his home or gaming box. Uh, it's practical because of bragging rights. Yeah, that's the one. People are still going to do it. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're not really going to use it. Uh, it's, it's, got, it's so massively overpowered. Yes, the transfer rates would be nice, yeah. but uh, I mean, it, it's a server part. It's really designed to be able to be hit millions of times a second. And that's why the IOPS are so important. In fact, Alan Malventano, when he was on Twiat talking about uh, latency, he said, mm -hmm. look, we're getting to the point where we're measuring SSDs the wrong way because we've been measuring them for the consumer side where you typically have one user running a couple of threads. But when you take those and you put them into a data center mm -hmm. where they're being accessed by thousands, tens of thousands of clients at any given time, the IOPS become incredibly important. The bandwidth is no longer important if it's just queuing up all the requests. Right, right. So that's not something that you would see in a home application at not, all? Yeah. Not really. <laughs> um, not going to stop people. <laughs> if you if you really want the uh, the fastest and you want to be able to have bragging rights, I mean that's it right now. There is nothing faster on the market. Period. Well, so let's find out what happens when you play Crisis on it, right? Isn't that the <laughs> nothing, the nothing, test? Nothing plays Crisis. Nothing. Plays oh, and crisis. by the way, I, I I have one here. What's that? So this what? is a DCP one thousand. Let's this see. Is the I don't one, believe I believe 1. that box 6 is empty. One point six terabytes. That's that's a uh, crack it open. So this is what it, it actually looks like. So it, it's you know like what you expected with the the standard PCIe cards. I've never seen memory have a heat sink like that before. Uh, it needs it because remember they're they're running this at an incredible clip, seven thousand megabytes per second, plus over a million IOPS. Now this is PCI times eight mm. revision three. So you need a, 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 a motherboard that's capable of having eight lanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't have revision three, if you have revision two, you actually have the, uh, the amount of bandwidth that you can get through this thing. And it doesn't matter what processor you're using, right? Does not matter. So this will work on any motherboard that does revision three and has eight lanes of PCIe available. Now, the important thing to remember behind this is, and, and you know, Kingston actually, they're, they're not, they don't really want to push what's behind this, uh, but there is a, a, a piece of silicon, a switch, mm -hmm. that switches between four different controllers, hmm. um, which 
is something that you need if you want to get really, really fast performance. Why is that? Well, because uh, what you can do is you can basically set up like a striped array inside. Um, it, it's, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Huh. But also it means that I don't have to use, like for example, if I wanted to get this kind of performance, I could do it with four eight lane M.2 uh, part components. Mm -hmm. But I don't have that many lanes left in my, my, uh, my PC. Because I'm using that switch, I can get away with using one set of, uh, of eight that's, PCIe Revision 3 lanes. That's pretty clever. That's very I like clever. that idea. And when you compare it to Optane, because remember the original poster's question was about Optane. Does Optane kill things like this? Not yet. Probably at some point, but they're definitely not there yet. Let, let, let's compare. 1.6 giga, 1.6 terabytes. This is terabytes. 1.6 terabytes of DCP-1000. As you mentioned, about a dollar a gigabyte. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's, it's pricey, but now compare that to 1.6 terabytes of Optane. Even at the most cost effective right now, uh, that's 46.50. <laughs> it's so a little bit of a price it, difference. Yeah, it's so. three times the price. And I don't, I'm pretty sure you're not going to find a controller that can fit 50 of those things. No. No. <laughs> no, that would no, be not, silly. Not going to happen. <laughs> uh, and you're talking about uh, 300,000 IOPS versus over a million IOPS. You're talking about 1.2 megabytes per second write, uh, uh, read, 280 megabytes per second write versus 7,000, 7,000. Okay. Uh, so it's just, it's phenomenally faster than Optane right now. So are you going to put this to the test? I already have. You already have? I already have. What, what applications are you using this for? Um, Adobe. Adobe? Okay. It's okay. pretty. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what, Brian? Sometimes I just want to have the shiny things, okay? I don't blame you. I mean, we were talking about bragging rights and why you'd want it. Don't shame me. <laughs> don't shame me. I will never shame you for your uh, PC components. Oh, thanks. Now, when we come back, we've got, uh, we've got a, a, an open boxing. Yes. Right? Unboxing? Yes. That thing. You can't see it. It's just under it's the frame. Just, it's hidden under the frame. But before we get there, let's go ahead and take a moment for these messages. Previously on Twit. Jeff Jarvis is here, unusually next to me, which means I can do, and uh, that's great. I <laughs> this week in Google. So the reason he mentioned this image recognition improvement is to announce a new project called Google Lens. I have been Come wanting on. this forever because I like constantly do things like walk through my yard and I'm like, ooh, is this a weed or is it a plant? Can oh, I eat it also, go. can I eat this? That's this something is that a human would be not as good at, right? The new screensavers. The Maker Fair in San Mateo. This is the original, the 12th annual. We met a lot of fans, but also saw oh, a so lot of fun. cool stuff. These are shadow boxes kids made. Maker Fair is so fun because it just shows human creativity, oh, creativity. ingenuity, Off and, scales. and technology. Know-how. This week we're going to do something a little bit different, which is deliberately infecting your network. This is something you should not do. We're, let's go ahead and run it. <laughs> Twit, making the world safe for technology. So this is the screen. Oh, wah, wah. Wah, wah. Wah, 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 wah. What happened to my computer? And we're back. Okay, so Brian, mm -hmm. I get toys yes. every once in a while. They just show up. I think we just talked about one, I, didn't we? Did. We, yeah. we talked about one, but, uh, but you know, I kind of like toys that help me see things better. <laughs> bright, shiny bright, toys. Shiny, bright, yeah. shiny toys. Yeah, and usually in a square format. I, well, if you say so. I mean, I, yeah. I wouldn't know, but, but right, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Th th that's actually the topic of the next bit of feedback. We had someone who watched something on another Twitch show and wanted mm -hmm. to know if maybe we had an opinion or two that we could throw her way. Uh, Brian, what do we, what we got from Selvi? All right, so Selvi asked, uh, a few days ago, I watched an episode of Twitch where they were checking out a new curved Acer monitor with eye tracking. I know you like Acer, so I was wondering, is it any good? Does the eye tracking actually work? It looks nice in the pictures, but how is it in person? Okay, now I, I checked it out. The one that uh, they actually saw on Twitch was the new 34-inch curved monitor from Acer, which absolutely is gorgeous. It's yes. beautiful. We don't have that. But it just so happened that a couple of days I got a little something something in that line if you want to help oh. me bring this thing up. Oh, this right yeah. here? Yeah, so this is the 27-inch version of that monitor that she was uh, she saw on Twitch. Ooh. Yeah, we actually we actually got it. So, Brian, if you'd like to do the honors, let's oh, go ahead and uh, open up this bad mamma jamma. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, Burke provided me with a proper knife for this. That's not... 
I, he's like, At what's all. it for? I was like, uh, opening a box? It's a, he just wanted mm. to go make it. A saw mm. is not a good way to open tape. I'm nope. just gonna, I'm gonna yeah, put that out there. That side. Oh my goodness. This is why we don't let Burke make decisions. Uh. Ah! <laughs> I totally, I'm totally about to do that. <laughs> don't <Okay>. cut my <laughs> direction. <laughs> Thanks, Burke. <laughs> could, could there be a more useless tool for thing. opening a box, Burke? <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right. All right. Be, it worked. Let's get this out of the way. It burked. It burked. That was definitely. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's some. Yeah. This just looks like just some components. Yeah, there. we don't need all that stuff. That's just like instructions and stuff. <laughs> uh, We're so good at that unboxing. We are guys. I wonder what's in here. I should probably not shake it. Okay, wait. We get. Wait, let's, Ooh. Come on. Ready? One, two. Wait, what it's are we big. grabbing? We got it. This whole thing. Ready? Yeah. Uh, Oh I, see. oh, I see the sexy coming out. <laughs> Nothing. I've, I've never wanted to hear you say that before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so this wow. is the 27-inch version of that 34-inch monitor that they had. It's a, it's a Predator. That uh, this nice. is the uh, Z271T. Now, the T is important. We're going to mention it in just a bit why. So of course it's curved. This is an, a 1980, not 1920, but 1980 by 1080. So it's slightly weird aspect ratio. 144 hertz refresh. Damn. If you're using DisplayPort, if you're using HDMI because of HDMI, it's going to top out at 60 hertz. I like this. It's 30 degree to 30 degree swivel nice. and minus five to 25 degree tilt. So I mean, already the base. I mean, I love this. One of the things I, I did not like about a previous Predator monitor was the base wasn't really flexible. No. They understand that people are gonna wanna, Ooh, you know, they're gonna wanna go up and down yeah. precisely. And oh, it's just, it's really, really well balanced. Uh, this does has NVIDIA G-Sync. So if you've got a, a G-Sync enabled card, mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, I mean, they've talked about this ad nauseum on Twitch. It syncs up the, the refresh rate of the monitor with the refresh rate of the card, which reduces the amount of tearing. And it, it's just, it's so butter smooth. I love it. Uh, it also, blue light mode, which is so popular right now, so that when it's nighttime... <laughs> blue light is so hot right now. It is. It's so. <laughs> uh, now, it's got a glossy coat, so you can see it right there, but it's actually mm. got an anti-glare coating. So, like, the one that I have in my office, which is the 34-inch one, it doesn't get nearly as much glare reflection as I, I thought it would. Right, because you, more than a flat panel, the curved ones will catch a lot more of the ambient light. So that's that's smart that they did that. Yeah, and actually, care if you go to the overhead, this is an 1800R curve. Ooh. So it's pretty pronounced. Uh, now, there are some people who don't like the curve. I'm, I'm still undecided. I've, I see it as a gimmick right now. But I have seen applications where it absolutely does make sense. It depends. It depends. I, I think I'm less of a fan of the uh, the very thin but very wide curved right. ones. Because, I don't know, it just feels like it's it's too squished in the middle. This one looks like it would be... I mean, I, I'll have to test it out to know for sure. But the best application is when you get two or three of these together and then line them up. And then yeah. it gives you that peripheral vision. Of course, there are a couple of other things. This, I love this. I, I thought I was going to hate it. It's a joystick control. What? So that's how you do the menus. This is actually a, a, a four-way control with <laughs> complete with click. It looks like the nub. It like is the, a nub. The it Lenovo is, it's nub. It's a little nub. Uh, so, you know, standard controls over here. Of course, USB 3, so it is a USB uh, 3 hub. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one in, you get three USB out. Nice. And as far as the inputs are concerned, which you know, as with all of the series uh, Predator monitors, can be hidden away. You've got DisplayPort, you've got HDMI, uh, and then you've got something for speaker power if, if you want to run speakers off this thing. Oh, by the way, it does have two stereo speakers built in. Hmm. Not the best, but, you know, that's kind of what you expect from integration. Yeah, it, speakers on a monitor are one of those things that you expect to have, but don't necessarily... Very rarely do they sound good. Well, yeah, it's like they're kind of if you need them in a pinch, but those shouldn't be the speakers you're relying on anyway. And the finish on it looks really nice. It's, it kind of yeah. has like that metallic... The brushed aluminum Brushed look. aluminum, yeah. yeah. Now here's the thing, Brian. Um, hmm? All that stuff, yeah. boring. 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 Because remember I said that this was the Z271T. Yes. The T was that is one? for Toby Eye Control. Toby? Toby, that's the name of the technology. So this, this thing actually will watch your eyes and allow you to control what's happening on the screen with just where you're looking. What? 
like yeah. the like a Minority Report kind of thing. Well, um, imagine if you were playing COD, and uh -huh. instead of having to use the mouse to go to someone, if you just looked at a character, you would automatically aim at that character. <laughs> It seems like cheating. <laughs> it's, it sounds like cheating, but it's not because there's yeah. it's not it's not a bot. It's actually you. Yeah. It's just you with much faster reflexes than your your eye to hand. That's crazy. Yeah. That's what this I is. I want to try that out. I uh, I have not tried it on my 34 inch because I don't game. Yeah. But you do, which is why I'm going to send you home with this this Ooh. bad boy. So I need I need your honest opinion on uh, on eye track gaming. Now the fun thing is we uh, we actually did get a. a an early look at this before it was even released into the general public. And mm -hmm. we looked at the Toby Eye Control at IFA last year. Right, yeah. Yeah, so let's go ahead and take a trip down memory lane and see what Eye Control can do for you. So, folks, what you're seeing right here is the eye tracking on the Predator 21. Uh, believe it or not, right now, I am not touching the keyboard at all. Instead, it's looking at where my eyes are looking and it's rotating the screen to match. Imagine what this could do for your gaming experience, where you shoot where you look. Now in a second here, it's going to move over to a, uh, a different screen where it's actually going to allow me to target and then fire only using the spacebar. So I'm not using any other keys except for the firing key, which is, is my spacebar. Let's see how I do. So standard spaceship scenario. And again, I'm looking to the left, I'm looking to the right. I'm looking for, oh, there's a target. So I'm only pressing the spacebar, I'm only firing but I'm aiming with my eyes. And again, this is a sort of a next-gen experience. It's one of these things where once you've seen it, and once you've seen it in action, it's very difficult to move back to the, uh, the old way of controlling your game experience. And uh, hold on, wait, I got bad guys here. Okay, you die, die, you die. Ah, ha, 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 ha. So if you want to see the latest and the latest and greatest in game control, you're going to need some uh, face tracking here on the Predator. Hold on, I'm, I think I'm about to die. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk over the last few months over curved monitors. Yes, they look cool. Yes, they're interesting. Yes, it's technology that we haven't seen before. But what really are they for? Well, here at IFA at the Acer booth, we found out exactly what they're for. My host, Cranky Hippo, is here playing Need for Speed, and what you see is probably the best demonstration of what curved monitors can do, especially in a multi-monitor setup. Now, games like Need for Speed, games like Rocket League, are being set up so that you get this wonderful view of uh, what it would actually be like to be in a cockpit. It's not just that flat screen that's dead in front of you, but you have your peripheral vision from the right and the left. Now, to make this work, it's not just simply a matter of hooking up a lot of monitors, because that, while it looks nice, is not going to give you the experience. You need software that's been designed to give you slightly different views on the left and the right so that it actually mimics what you get with your peripheral vision. You're also going to want a certain piece of technology called G-Sync. It's going to make sure that you're not going to get frame shearing between the screens as the frame rate rises. Oh, this is only going to be possible when you've got really powerful desktops, something like the Acer Predator that we're playing on right now. And again, you are going to need a, a large workspace in order to make this a complete experience. But I will say this, after looking at this, after playing this game, after seeing what it does for the gaming experience, once you've gone with curved multiple monitors, you won't want to go back. It's like a taxi driver this morning. Or in the middle, Brian. I'm gonna thread the, thread the needle. needle. Or not? Ooh, not even close. <laughs> now that really did show. That was the first time I thought curved monitors were actually useful rather than just gimmicky. Yeah, because it feels more like a windshield it when it's like that. It and does. Uh, even with the bezel kind of along the sides, when you're focused on the main screen, that all kind of just blends into your peripheral. And games where I think one game I played once was uh, Rocket League. And when you can see, it's such an advantage to be able to see things coming at you from the side. You don't realize how much is cut off when you're just watching uh, one small right. screen. Right. And yeah, it, it, it's kind of cool to, to simulate the peripheral vision. So things get mm -hmm. stretched towards the edges. That's why games have to be specifically designed, designed for, for it. Yeah. And it looks, it does look a sh little strange. Like if you had, um, so the three monitors set up and you turn your head and you look at like the side of the monitor, things are stretched. 
but that's so that when you are looking at it straightforward, straightforward it, it all makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, here's the thing though. When yeah. I've been playing with curved monitors, what I find is they work best with other curved monitors. Right. Putting a curved monitor right next to a flat monitor feels weird. Right. It feels very, very weird. Right. Yeah, because my setup at home right now, I have two monitors, and they're flat, and the, you know they're side by side. But if I were to use this, yeah. I would probably just set aside the other two and just use the one well, curved monitor. What I was able to do in that case, I had the flat monitor in the middle, and then it, I put two flat panels. Of flat mm. monitors on oh, the edges. I could do that. That kind of works, uh, but I mean, you you do feel like the the aspect ratio changes when you go from one screen to the next. Yeah, yeah, it's it's still good. So, and to properly test this out, I might need a new machine. We might have to build that. Home. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Easy enough. Because yeah, what was the resolution on this one? This was uh, 1980, 1980 by uh, by twelve hundred or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So I think I've, I, sorry. at home I have a seven eighty GTX that I'm borrowing from this, Russell. This will work. This will work. Yeah. <laughs> so hmm. That yeah, does. I'm looking forward to trying this out. All right. Cool. Let's do one last one, a parting shot, if you were. And I think all of us uh, old system builders can feel this person's pain. Brian, we got something from um, someone by the name of Jeff Galley. All right, so Jeff asks, who else has had that one who says to you, my PC seems to be running slow and it keeps shutting down. When you open the case, the problem <laughs> hits you in the face. And when you ask the person, have you ever cleaned or had the inside of your PC cleaned? And they just look at you and say, why do you need to clean it? <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, OK, so uh, stay, stay on that, Kara, because this, my friends, is not the worst I've ever seen. The worst I've ever seen. Is your brothers? What, yeah, smoker. <laughs> so when you, have a, when you put all that tar into the machine, and then then you put it on the floor so it gathers up dust bunnies. Uh, it, it was it wasn't like oily dust. Yeah, it was hard like clay dust basically. Uh, and it like short stuff out. It shorts. Point. Yeah, it gets conductive. But you know the bit the biggest problem is that absolutely will stop a fan. So now you have zero <laughs> airflow over the things that are getting hot. Like the one on the right? That looks like a satellite <laughs> image does. of the moon or something. <laughs> that's horrible. Uh, yeah, that's what happens. See, uh, that's probably not doing much cooling. I think that's Ugh. a heat sink that the fan is supposed to be blowing through. Uh, and and I, I have to say, if we ran a bacterial swab on that, it would probably not come back with refreshing results. I mean, I have to say I'm, pretty, I'm guilty of not cleaning out my PC often, but... I, I do it at least once I, a year. I, mine has never looked like that. No, no. Even with a corgi, it doesn't <laughs> look that bad. You actually have another corgi living in your PC. It does. Uh, yeah. Amazing. It, it, just hair. Just a <laughs> hair corgi. But thank Oof. you, Jeff. We all we all could stand a little reminder every once in a while that it's nice to take the can of compressed air and blow out the PC. Which, by the way, if you're going to do that, do it outside. Take it outside. Or do it in Padre's room. No, yeah. take it outside. <laughs> take it outside. Anyways, we want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, uh, we're going to thank Kara, because Kara's freaking awesome. Kara Cole. Kara Cole. Me but, first? No, no. We, we, well, we just, we'll get to you. We're going to get to you. I just, <laughs> I just want to first. acknowledge the fact that you're here instead of Alex. We're building up the excitement. Alex is in New York yeah. being yeah. lazy yeah. and probably sweating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be like 90 or something yeah, there. Yeah. But before we get to her, we do want to uh, direct you to the place where you can find the notes. If nice. you want to find the links for any of the products that we played with, or perhaps or about to play with, or about to play with, or perhaps you want to find the code from the, that episode where we did the Arduino 102 EE proms, you can always find it at our show notes. Which Brian, where do they go? They live at twit.tv/kh, and not only will you find the show notes and the links for all the things that we talked about, but you can also download or subscribe to the show. Yeah. Uh, don't forget that we also have a social group at uh, Google+. Plus. You just go to Google+, Plus, look for the know-how group, ask to be added, because mm -hmm. we try to keep out all the spam accounts. And in an instant, you'll have access to over 11,000 key That's our know-it-alls, people who can help you with questions you might have, or maybe, maybe people that you can drop your knowledge on top of. It's all part of the cycle <laughs> of the maker. <laughs> the cycle of knowledge. Cycle of the knowledge. But also that's how we get questions for yeah. the show and you can post pictures like those disgusting pictures. Please do that. Like if you have we gross PCs that you haven't cleaned yeah. out, take pictures of those and post them in the Google Plus. Actually, let's do this challenge. We mm. want your pictures. So if you've got a PC, open that case and take a picture. Just do Even if it's clean, just let us know that you're running a clean ship. You should do it before and after. Like yeah. show how bad it 
was, and then be proud of like how clean you can get it afterwards. Yeah. And and if you really want it clean, you can actually take your PC as long as you remove all the panels, you can put it in the dishwasher, <laughs> and it, it will work. Just totally, totally will work. You just gotta blow dry don't it don't. <laughs> afterwards. Seriously don't, seriously, don't do that. Some people might try it. <laughs> don't joke. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> they, should, they shouldn't joke. But that's not the only place they can find us, Brian. No, 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 it's not. Uh, if you want to follow us on another social platform, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at cranky underscore hippo. And you can find me at Padre SJ. And Kara Cole, where do the people find you? Uh, on what did you in the vo- keep picking in the up void. In, the, in the void? I'm way over here. Um, on Twitter at Kara080. All right. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go ask questions. Because that's what this episode was. (laughs) (laughs) Show us your gross innards. (laughs) Show us your thoughts.